Hello and welcome to our Leaders Talk segment. Today, we look forward to gain insight from an organization that has been instrumental in bringing about a positive, meaningful, and sustainable change in the lives of the most vulnerable and the most marginalized sections of the society, particularly the women, youth, and children. This is the American India Foundation, which is also the recipient of the CSR Universe COVID Response Impact Awards 2021 in the healthcare category. Precisely because in the last one, one and a half years, the foundation has played a vital catalytic role in orchestrating rescue initiatives and plans to especially assist the healthcare industry, which was facing major challenges during the COVID crisis. And today, we are delighted to have with us Ms. Kavita Srivastava, Director, Strategic Partnership at the American India Foundation to share her views. A very warm welcome to you, Ms. Kavita. Yeah, thanks, Ruchika. Thanks for having me here. So, uh, Kavita, the American India Foundation has played a crucial role in the COVID, during the COVID crisis, especially assisting the healthcare industry of India. So, uh, firstly, I would like you to share and elaborate the initiatives that were rolled out at your end and what were the major challenges and hurdles that you had to face during the execution of this project. Okay. So, I will just give you a quick background, Ruchika, of what AIF does. Uh, so that you understand the context when we're talking about the work we do. So AIF has been, American India Foundation has been working in India for the last 20 years. Um, and our mission uh, is essentially to work and you know towards improving lives of the underprivileged, uh, especially the youth, the women and children. And we do this through our high impact interventions in the area of education, health and livelihood. Yeah. In the last 20 years, we've been able to impact the lives of over 9.2 million people across uh, 30 states in the country. Um, having said this, uh, we partner with various stakeholders to create, to test and develop innovative social uh, solutions and you know, create social impact that is long term and sustainable. Also work with the government very closely in all our three uh, flagship programs that we work in. Our idea as an organization, like, uh, you know, we want to create is to improve the lives of these people. And having said this, it's very important because poverty is multidimensional. So we don't touch upon lives at each stage of these set of people. They are going to bound to lose opportunity. Right. Having that in mind, uh, you know, we have our flagship programs. And like I said, we work very closely with the government. When the COVID phase started last year, we were already working with government schools and with public health care systems uh, through our various projects. When the first phase of COVID started, uh, you know, we realized that the hospitals at the state reached out to us saying there are needs in the particular hospital in a particular state. Obviously, the last year's COVID was far different from what we saw in the second phase uh, in this year. So we did reach out to people. We reached out to various stakeholders, including donors, organizations, vendors, suppliers, to make sure that we all come together and meet the needs of these uh, government hospital institutions that needed like you know maybe the ppe kits or you know oxygen uh, masks you know so we had some amount of learnings there and experience there and we continued with our regular programs under education health and livelihood continued to work with the government when the second phase come in which was very and far more different and far more uh, you know deeper and more gruesome than what what it was last year because there was uh, we could see impact in our own households and requests from the states started coming we reached out and devised a strategy saying in this particular covid how do we step up an action and make sure that we create impact on the ground faster able to reach out the beneficiaries faster we already we created a strategy that talked about short term medium and that time it was medium we were hoping to get out of it in a couple of months we didn't really expect this to go this long to look at how are we going to impact and what is the need on the ground uh, obviously because of our past experience in the last 20 years we had our you know supported donors we had people we could reach out to and then we reached out to government to understand what is the need in their states very quickly, we identified those needs. Uh, we had suppliers, we gained experience, we did partnerships to make sure that we got the donors who were willing to cooperate and help us with those funds and with the state and the respective hospitals on what they needed in terms of uh, equipments, life-saving equipments, materials. And that's how the work started. 
um, slowly as we realized that it was getting, you know, it was getting longer, we started looking at long term engagements and how do we create long term strategies to make sure that this is there. And that's how actually we went about doing this kind of work. Um, and more and more states came in, we had more partnerships with the government, we got more requests from the hospitals, uh, we got, uh, you know, uh, you know, a very good response from our donors and sponsors who you know, wanted to, you know, wanted to make a difference at this point in time. So we all actually got together, it was just not one set of people who were doing this, it was the whole universe that came together to make sure that whatever was needed on the ground was done. So that's how, you know, we initiated this uh, whole process. So what were the major hurdles that you faced during the execution of the strategy? Hurdles like, um, you know, where the whole country was shut, we had limitations on travel, so our existing programs had to be relooked. We were already working with children, we had our live youth centers, we were already working with the ASHA workers or the Anganwadis in our, you know, in our uh, healthcare projects. So we had to, in that sense, for our normal programs, we had to relook at the whole strategy. We had to create uh, remedial sessions, we had to do uh, integrated projects, we had to do, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we had to do, uh, you know, programs which were otherwise supposed to be offline, but now I had to look at how you do online, how and more and more people could do. So that was something that we had to work with. As far as COVID response and hurdles were concerned, obviously we couldn't reach out to the ground. We couldn't be there. We had to rely on people, on vendors, on, you know, how we can reach out to that last mile. Uh, and the COVID, uh, you know, and one of the opportunities it also helped us becoming more virtual. Uh, everything would happen on an online, on a Zoom, and with the support of people, though that was a hurdle, we also saw it as an opportunity to be able to reach out in newer ways to donors and our beneficiaries. So while we faced these hurdles, but I think we just came across, we you know found solutions and we managed to implement our work on the ground. So more light on how did you leverage the digital communication tools in your projects and initiatives? So in our projects in education, for example, in schools, we identified how can we give, you know, tablets or how, you know, to the teachers, the students who didn't have access, those who had smartphone access, how did we create those models and taught them on the over the phone, you know, so there was continuity of education. Yeah, we gave them building materials, so we went to the community, we gave them materials that they could see, there was community engagement in smaller groups. As far as the education program was concerned, as far as our healthcare program, obviously, you know, the healthcare workers on the field, but how do you then through mobile create, uh, you know, materials and content that could be given to them, that could be done. Our livelihood centers that you know, were running offline had to be done online mode. So our teachers started giving train online. We got people on our Zoom calls. We started giving them and engaging with them online. With our beneficiaries, that's how we got. With our stakeholders, with our donors, online communication became far more important. There were presentations, pitches, reviews that happened online. You know, so we had to adjust to the new normal and make sure that we give a blended approach. So wherever we could go offline in smaller batches, we did that. Wherever we had to do online, we mm -hmm. made sure that we got systems, processes, people together so that there was no, um, you know, there was continuity in the work that we were doing. And that's what, yeah, that's something that we... Um, so what was the geographical reach of your projects? So the geographical reach we uh, for our COVID response, like I said, we are in 30 states. We reached out. We still thought we have to reach out to you know the far and the you know lands of uh, like the Naga land and the northeast. But we managed to you know impact and give supplies and you know life saving equipment to wherever we could possibly do that. You know uh, across uh, to where we could manage to reach and wherever we got requests from. So, for example, uh, in the COVID response, we've managed to, uh, you know, give about, um, I think, about 51, uh, install 51 oxygen plants across uh, 13, 14 states. We have about 2,700 hospital, portable hospital units uh, that, uh, you know, we set up in, our, in the existing government hospitals just to make sure that there was, uh, you know, no shortage of space or beds for people who were in need. So this is something that we reached out to as far as the geographies are concerned. And I, I believe that the organization is also currently and closely working uh, with the government and assisting it with the vaccination drive. Right. And there has been a problem of uh, vaccine hes hesitancy at the ground level, especially, uh, you know, uh, rural areas and right. urban areas. So how are you coping with that? 
So like, you know, um, like Ritika, all our projects have very closely been with engaging with stakeholders. So here we've tied up or we've had an MOU with the government. We worked very closely with the state government, identifying which other districts that we want to reach. Through our behavioral change campaign, which is called uh, Mission Corona, we're creating communication materials that talk about vaccine hesitancy, talks about the myth around it. We're creating awareness amongst this section, certain sections of people who will be last in the line, may not get access or don't have uh, you know, the technology and the know-how to get into uh, getting into vaccinations. For example, like the street vendors, he loses a one day of wage if he's not if he's going to stand in the line and not get his turn. Or you know, um, you know, sex workers or people with disability or you know, the tribal population. So how do you reach out to them? So we've always, you know, we've had uh, spoken to the government, we've spoken to the state authorities, identified which other district they would want us to go, making sure that we get, uh, you know, we get uh, access to their situation, go and do a cha change campaign there uh, with the help of various stakeholders, uh, make sure that we make the beneficiary reach uh, the destination for the first vaccine, which is already there in the government facility, and then make sure we follow up with them, we engage with them, we tell them the benefits and you know uh, why we need to vaccine, and make sure that they go for the second dose, ultimately till they get a vaccination certificate. So that's a whole campaign that we run, and uh, we are going to impact. We are going to reach out to about one million uh, people and stakeholders in this category of vulnerable population that, these, that I mentioned to you about. So it's largely about creating behavioral change campaigns, spots, uh, you know, materials, content, which are very region specific, which the community is able to identify far easily and able to relate far better. So how effective has, has your partnership with your uh, corporate partners been during the COVID crisis? And have you seen an increase in the number of COVID uh, corporate partners for uh, AIS? So for AF, yes, if you look at the way we partnered until last year to our regular programs, and especially under COVID, I think, you know, we've been really thankful to our partners, whether, you know, it's the uh, philanthropists who've come together or it's a group of people who've come together and corporates in India who, you know, come out and helped us in achieving, you know, and being able to give, uh, you know, what is needed on the ground with a very immediate turnaround time. So we've definitely seen a lot of corporates who've stood up, come together and helped us in this process and supported us. So we've definitely seen a, a, a spike in that. And we've also seen, uh, you know, a lot of um, cooperation, not only from the, just the corporate, the CSRT, but also the employees who've come together and raised funds at this point in time of crisis, where you know, everybody was coming together. It was never just about India. It was everybody was going through the same uh, set of challenges. So I think uh, we've had, uh, you know, the corporate power that we've worked with or have funded us for COVID, but immensely thankful to them for the kind of support they've extended to us. Can you, can you name a few of your corporate partners that have worked closely last year? So right from uh, Bank of America to us, who supported us for you know all the hospital beds this year? Uh, I would like to name EXL Services. We have um, Punjab National Housing, uh, Punjab National Housing Finance Limited. We have uh, uh, you know we've had. Um, I'm just trying to recollect a few top of my names. Um, there would be uh, we've had yeah we've had Adobe that has been there with us. We have Micron Technologies that have come forward. We've had uh, you know. Uh, support from a lot of other corporates. You know, Lenovo has helped us, uh, you know, do a hospital, portable hospital bed unit in, uh, you know, the, we've had Goldman Sachs has come forward to do this. So there's a lot of corporates who in their own way have helped us reach out in some form or the other under the COVID response. I may have not named the larger few ones, but excuse me for that right now. All right. So uh, with the new CSR, you know, uh, CSR becoming you know, completely changed after uh, the CSR laws were passed in India. Yeah. In, and also the uh, what made mandatory by the Companies Act in 2013. Right. Uh, what are your expectations from your corporate partners akin to that? And also the, the parliament has passed the FCRA bill last year. So uh, where do you think, how do you think, how much do you think this is feasible and logically uh, logical for you administratively and financially as an implementation agency? So far as us in AIF, when you know the change in the FCRA norm came, and you know we were as it is, you know we were already doing. I think almost ninety percent of our work was self-implementing on the ground. So there was we saw continuity of our work. 
you know, we saw that uh, there was continuity because we were implementing ourselves. And that, I think, gave us that, uh, you know, um, edge to be able to uh, continue with our existing uh, projects and programs and with our existing corporate donors. Uh, so as far as those norms are concerned, obviously there have been few changes and recent changes again and given clarifications on the CSR, uh, you know, implementation part of it. But I think that, uh, you know, what I would uh, and what we are already doing with our corporate partners is to work very closely as partners, you know, not as uh, to work towards creating that impact. So while we will still look at long term engagements, how do we make it more sustainable? How do we make it within the line of what the CSR is permitting us to do? And I think there are various opportunities that we see happening in that sense. So I don't see uh, for us at AIF where we had a little bit of struggle uh, because we were already a self-implementing organization. All right. So um, because it's the American India Foundation, right, what right. have been uh, the key learnings or the you know exchange of knowledge with, with the American, their, their concept, the American concept of CSR? And how well have you incorporated that in the Indian So, um, you know, most of our donors, like we said, are, you know, from India, CSR, and we also have those that come in from the US. Um, but largely because the work is in India, it's to do the way we are, our social impact on the ground, the kind of work that we do on the ground. How do we report it? What kind of measures do we adopt? So we've had seen learnings and cross learnings as well, saying how do we, uh, you know, engage with, uh, the corporates who are based in the US, how do we engage with them and create, uh, you know, and show them the impact that they want to see. And that more or less, I think, to my mind is the same because every corporate or every donor wants to see how the work that, you know, the, what money they've given us or how they've given us a grant is how it is utilized on the ground. A proof of concept, uh, you know, an on-ground experience is something that is there, which I think, uh, you know, we've been able to deliver successfully and you know, showcase the kind of work we've been doing and create the impact that was expected out of us to create. So I think there has been both. We've learned from them. They've learned from us. And, you know, we're together in this, uh, you know, journey of making sure that we uh, change lives of uh, the people of our beneficiaries here in India. So uh, as we see that corporates are now, you know, uh, contributing to the PM Cares Fund also. Right. So what are your expectations from corporates on their CSR fund allocation to different theme, thematic areas in today's changing scenario? So um, obviously there are various charities and various organizations that do different work, which is definitely meaningful, far more impactful. Um, and there is the PM Cares funds as well. Um, I think as and there are corporates who are wanting to be with both areas. There are corporates who give us for a long-term project, or let's continue to various other organizations. I think what we now look at is looking at how we create more sustainable partnerships, more long-term models, and more engaging, more engaging partnerships. It's not limiting, uh, you know, a CSR grant given and we implement on the ground. But how do we work together to make sure that we create that impact? Engaging not only the corporates, but also their employees of how they can contribute. So I think that's something that the corporates, we've seen that changing environment where the corporates are coming forward and, you know, looking at how do we create an impact uh, together create partnerships, expertise in building those. So I think even with the PM Fair Funds or you know, with a, a lot of charities doing work in different thematic areas, I think there is scope and there is definitely room to do so much more in our country. And you know, because of COVID, it's just taken us back. To, you know, it just pulled us back. So now we have to take four steps forward to make sure we come back to where we were uh, and then move forward. So I think there is a lot of scope and I think uh, corporates in the CSR in India is definitely looking at it in that direction. There are more uh, you know, innovative uh, concepts, more innovative ways of engaging in partnerships that are coming forward. Uh, both corporates and the CSR you know, and the NGOs are looking together on how do we now work in this new changing environment and what it, COVID has taught us. So I think it's it's going to be far more engaging, a far more collaborative uh, you know, partnership that we see in the near future so now uh, since you know it is becoming better covid is now hopefully going away so uh, how is uh, aif going to change their social work strategy uh, for us the next two three years is going to understand how do we come back and get our programs back to where we were two years back 
because uh, you know the program has happened schools have shot livelihood centers have shot we've not you know people midday meals were not you know because schools were shot people were, children were not getting midday meals so how do we go back right now the uh, our core focus i think the next two three years is going to be how do we now rebuild lives you know we've seen a lot of lives lost a lot of people losing their jobs we've seen uh you know nutrition is something that we want to take care you know to want to take as a priority again in the next two three years i've seen how uh children have been impacted and how nutrition levels of children have gone down because of the school how children especially in the tribal or in the migrant population the children have stopped going to school so in our own projects in our existing how do we make sure that we bring the children back making sure that their learning levels are the same you know grade appropriate learning because a lot of children have lost out on you know a lot of uh, studies so how do we bring them back how do we create livelihood opportunities for those who've lost their primary incomes uh, income you know a primary earning member you um, know how do we engage with the youth right now to make sure that you know they gain you know successful and meaningful employment so that's something that you know is going to be the core focus of we have what we do uh, you know of rebuilding our, and i'm looking at our programs in a more different way still able to create the same impact and the same levels of expectations so um as you're saying that you have to go back to your old strategies and your old programs the traditional of uh, strategies so was there a reduction in funds during the covid crisis from those traditional uh, strategies or initiatives that you had to uh, specifically covid uh, initiatives so we did see uh, a small drift in uh, you know a lot of um, you know ngo um, a lot of corporates wanting to give to us covid relief and of course that's you know that's you know that's what the need of the hour was but i think Uh, you know a lot of corporates also helped us in uh, relooking at how we could or realign our strategy in our existing projects in blended approach um, how do we look at uh, remedial uh, education how do we look at how do we you know uh, so i think it's been both we've also seen a lot of corporates who you know uh, you know move their funds towards covid because that was the need of the hour simultaneously also corporates who helped us in identifying what do we do in a situation like this how do we make sure that our children don't get affected how do we make sure that the the teachers continue to give uh, you know run classes or even if it's online how do we reach out to these children that are impacted or are not able to go to school how do we reach out to the youth who are looking out for jobs or are looking for skill those are some things that i think it was both ways we did see a shift but we also saw a lot of support from our existing partners uh, making sure we realign our strategies and our thinking towards the Uh, scenario that we have to you know be counter so that's um, many corporates had spent you know surplus amount yeah. last yeah. year yeah. and uh, as a set of as set of policy has come in do you think csr funds are going to come down this year from this year onwards it is um i think a lot will depend on how we see uh, you know uh, this whole covid phase coming down and how do we see uh, what kind of you know how do we go back so right now you know the whole focus is on how do we go back to where we were so even you know the corporates i think when we go to our corporate donors looking at how do we now work in that direction so um, obviously the covid has impacted but i think we are yet to see or to know i, I think as time will tell as we move forward um to see what kind of impact it actually um, gives not only on the total you know uh, this but also on the cs target and uh, the funds that we receive i think it's to just wait and see on what kind of response because a lot of csr changes have also happened in the last couple of months mm-hmm. uh, i think it will it will need some time for you know the corporates also to you know realign look at what they want how their strategy is and uh, you know realign uh, you know or really relook at the strategies that they've had Uh, keeping in mind the current context and you know what we are doing uh, and post covid uh, project so uh, lastly i would like to know what is the organization's mission for the next decade so rajka like i said you know uh, whatever we do our mission our vision has always been to make sure that we contribute towards building a country where all people have uh you know access to uh you know quality healthcare services access to education and for livelihood opportunities so every work that we continue to do in the next decade or you know from now on will be in that direction will be in the areas 
Um, but there's so much to do right now in our existing project. I think that for the next two, three years, like we said, our, you know, our education program, livelihoods, our health program, how are we going to look at it and make sure that, you know, we, uh, you know, make sure that the lost time of people who've been impacted are, you know, brought back? How do we rebuild those and then look at further, uh, you know, uh, scaling up or deepening our projects. For example, in, you know, just to give an education, uh, technology has driven so much. The schools have this science, technology, robotics, coding, there's so much more that's happening. So how do we use those innovative models? How do we, you know, become, uh, you know, our projects become more dynamic to be able to, you know, uh, meet and bridge that gap uh, because we work with government schools, we you know we work with the uh, marginalized communities as far as our livelihood centers are concerned, or with you know um, uh, youths from. So how? So the first, I think, the next two three years will be building and, and rebuilding all those things, and then when we look forward towards new thematic areas, or we do, our core will still strength will still stay the same. We will still have education, health, and livelihood as far as I see it. Uh, but we will also engage in a more meaningful way and deepen our engagement with our stakeholders and beneficiaries. Thank you so much. That was very insightful and a very useful interaction that we had with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, on behalf of CSR Universe, I would like to congratulate the entire team of American India Foundation for the win. And uh, best of luck for all your future endeavors. Thank you so much, Ruchika. Thank you very much. Thank you.